Welcome to the Coaches Notepad, a second webinar, and we have today Ben King, who is the lead youth development face coach at Walsall Football Club. So uh, thank you, Ben, for coming today and delivering a, a webinar about developing the individual in an academy uh, environment. So without taking any further time, uh, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, I watched the one with uh, Rob Williams, thought it was really good. So uh, excited for this today. Um, so share my screen. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about developing the individual um, using a, a multidisciplinary approach, um, focus on coaching, analysis and psychology. So just to give a little bit of context about myself first, so I, I've, um, I've got the A license, um, done the Advanced Youth Award and done a master's um, in performance coaching at the University of Stirling. Um, I started at Watford uh, probably about 10 to 12 years ago um, as a casual coach, just working in the community and volunteering part-time uh, part in the academy. Um, after a few years there, I went to, to UK Elite um, over in America and coached there for a couple of years, came back, came to Coventry as a, a full-time um, community coach um, and got promoted to disability development officer there um, and, and worked with the academy there um, with the under 11s in my, uh, my second year there. Um, from that, I went to Shrewsbury Town as a lead foundation phase coach um, and later on got promoted to uh, take that as well as um, be the under 18s individual development coach, which is probably when I started to do a lot more of the individual coaching and you know developed a passion for to working with individual players and how the analysis and psych stuff can work alongside the coaching. Um, and now I'm in my role at, uh, at Warsaw. Um, so I've, I've done as, as lead uh, youth development phase coach. So I've done a lot of individual stuff, not only within the YDP, um, the players 13 to 16, um, but I've done work with the 18s as well. Um, so, talking about obviously developing um, or using coaching analysis and psychology, um, we're going to start on the coaching. So I'm going to try and just break that, break it down a little bit um, to what it looks like, and I'll, I'll break it down further as, as this goes on. Um, so when I'm coaching, and again, this is my um, my perception or my um, conception of of what this should look like um, so when looking at the coaching I want to try I generally try to make it context specific um, so there's a reason why we're doing things and there's a picture to what we're doing rather than just doing a session because it looks good um, you've got to think about the structure so I'll think about how I structure what I'm doing and then the trade-offs within that um, I try to make it strengths-based so focused on the individual's strengths um, either developing that even further or developing things around that which will get it out. So, for example, um, if their strength is, is um, shooting, finishing, um, then one of the things around that might be their touches in the final third. So developing, can they set themselves up to take that shot? Um, so it might not be an area of development, but it might be you know, something that's average at the minute. Um, obviously, having an individual focus regardless of whether that be in the individual in an individual session, the individual in a position specific session or the individual in a team session um, or a game. Uh, and then my coaching behaviors as well and how that affects the individual. In terms of the analysis using both performance um, video and data analysis um, and how both of those can be used. Um, contrasting. So looking at and, and benchmarking so looking at how players um, in the same team maybe, or in different teams um, can be compared against each other or should or shouldn't be compared against each other. Role modeling. So looking at individuals in the, either in the premier league or the highest level, um, or maybe role modeling players that have um, been in your first team, or maybe even players that have been in the academy that have progressed into the first team. So what do they look like? Um, the self-reflection um, for individuals. So can they use analysis by themselves? And then obviously monitoring performance over time. And then the psycho uh, psychological element of that, um, you know, a lot comes will come on to in terms of the coach-athlete relationship and the motivational climate 
Um, but the, a big part of that would be the target setting and, you know, how you use the target setting. So I try to use process focused rather than outcome focused. Um, trying to create an environment which is highly supportive and highly challenging. Um, and I know that's something that Rob mentioned in his when he's working with coaches and it's exactly the same with players. Um, and then development of self-training. So I'll come on a little bit about um, creating an um, autonomy supportive environment. So first of all, obviously, the individual is the, is the key part to this. But obviously, if I'm delivering this program, then my influences and my um, ability will have an impact on on the individual. So um, this is something. This is my conceptualization of of the coaching process. Um, so this is, to be fair, this is something I had to deliver to do on my um, on my masters. Um, so on the left hand side, you've got me, the coach. Um, so obviously, my knowledge, my experience. Um, the behaviors that I prefer to use or generally will use will then have an impact um, plus the influences and by influences I mean anything that's going on so if it's a bad day at the office then that might change my coaching behaviors you know whether I like it or not it is going to have an impact in some degree um, on the right hand side you've got the athlete so again their ability um in the different corners plus the influences have they had a good day at school a bad day at school um you never know and again that's always going to have an impact on what what they're doing um and then obviously the interactions in between both of us so if you look at the the top one which is coaching uh, coach decision making and actions the actions that i then have um and the player tasks i create and the practice design that i use will then obviously have an impact on the athlete. Then my perception of their um, actions. So what I see might change the what I then do. So their strengths, their weaknesses, their influences, their reaction, because I might set up a practice and suddenly I realize they switched off, which then has an impact on me. And then obviously you've got the interference in the middle, which you know can be anything. It could be the coach-athlete relationship. If I don't have a relationship with that player, then you know a lot of these things will break down. Um, and the same with peers, you, you know, we all, we all know and individuals and we all know players that if you're working with them in a small group, they're great and they want to learn and they, you know, you sit down with them and talk to them and they're great. As soon as they're in a team environment or there's, there's a certain individual with them, suddenly they're an absolute nightmare. So again, these will all have an impact on this. So then it comes on to, you know, how we deliver and what we deliver. Um, so I think one of the one of the biggest things is you know we just take video analysis for example, um, and you need to be aware of the way you deliver things and how you deliver things. So you know there's a, there was a study on the left hand side um, by Middlemass and Harwood um, which talked about um, players' perceptions of of video analysis sessions. So this is your standard video analysis session on a say a Friday um, Friday before the Saturday game. Um, or maybe on Monday after the Saturday game um, and what they felt of the session. So when it was team focused, you know, a number said, yeah, yeah, it was great for building, you know, team cohesion. Um, but a lot of the time it, it lacked any, it wasn't specific to them. Um, and also, you know, for certain individuals, it was like oh, embarrassment of mistakes. Um, then obviously you've got like, you know, pre-match preparation. So again, some of them want to, like that they're you know they might have you know pounding music and things like that and they get motivated by that what others won't or won't need it um and then you've got the individual ones so the one-to-one -one focused uh, video feedback um just in the middle of that um which again has you know pretty positive in terms of it reduces the embarrassment so if it's one-to-one -one, um you know they're not going to worry about what their mates think um the coach detail and the the um the video itself is more specific to them um, and offers deeper, deeper reflection. Um, so, I mean, th those are probably the, the two I'll focus on in this, like mainly the one-to-one -one focused um, feedback. Um, on the right-hand side, another, um, it's something called self-determination theory. Um, and this sort of links into the delivery of what you do. So they need competence, uh, autonomy, and relatedness. Um, so you take the competence, you know, let's say it's when we're target setting, obviously they need to know that or feel that they are capable of doing what we're setting them. 
So it's no good if I put them in an environment they just cannot handle. Um, the relatedness is obviously the re relationship I have with them. So again, I can set my target, but if they don't care what I think, um, or they're, even if they're peers or in the environment they're in, they're, they're not close to people, then the target goes out the window. And then the autonomy with that, um, obviously they need to make decisions. And again, this is where I think it's when you're setting targets, for example, they need to have an impact on what that target is. It can't just be right. I'm setting you this. They need to have an input into what that is. Um, and it creates that autonomy based environment. So what that might look like over, over a week, say, um, you know, you've got your sort of more, uh, individual to team, um, focused interactions with players across a week. Um, and then you've got your structured, um, so quite ad hoc um, conversations. So for example, if you look at bottom left, like the informal conversations, I think that's one of the most powerful tools um, in terms of building a, a coach athlete relationship and also coaching. Um, if I'm working with an individual, I'll be honest, most of the time uh, in a game, say, the conversation walking from the changing room up to the pitch is massive and the same you know after the game i've had more conversations with players after the game where they've been a lot more open walking from the pitch down to the uh, changing rooms and they're saying yeah i, I didn't feel on it today like I, I, I kept seeing this but i kept pressured kept getting pressured from here and i just i couldn't seem to get around it and kept driving into that uh, that same area and again th those are brilliant interactions which we we don't really think about it's very easy to sort of think right okay oh, we've lost today, so I'm just going to storm down to the change room or I'm going to stay up on the Astro and, and get the equipment in. It's like, you know, you're losing valuable um, opportunities there. Um, so I think that's massive. Then obviously as you build up to more structured with the individual, you've got the, uh, you know, you're coaching in a training session. So you're working with an individual in a training session. Um, I think it's it will be on the ideal level. And if you're an individual coach and that was your job, um, having one-to-one -one meetings. And again, it doesn't have to be formal as a one-to-one -one sit down meeting, but it can be, you know, if you're working with professional players, it could be in a coffee shop. It could be, you know, at the training ground somewhere, just away from people. Um, and then obviously completely structured would be your individual sessions where you're, you're setting that session up for that individual. And then obviously as you work across, you've got the unit. So it might be position specific stuff or the team stuff. But again, there's the opportunity to have those informal conversations, those that ad hoc coaching within the social games, within the team meetings, team analysis, team sessions. So going back onto that setting targets. So obviously when you're working with the individual, a lot of the time we want to, you know, we do want to set targets. Um, I think the, the biggest thing when it comes to setting targets is ultimately we need to, as a, as a coach and as a club, we need to know, right, is this individual developing? And a, a good way to show that is going, right, okay, these are these targets across this season. This is what we're expecting and expecting to see. So you can, you can almost monitor that development. And that could be not only from our point of view, but it might be from a key stakeholder's point of view. Because ultimately, when I report to the academy manager, um, they're going to ask questions, okay, how is this player getting on? Uh, and I need to be able to say, well, yeah, you know, we've set him this target and he's done this really well. Um, we set him this target and he, he's achieved that. Um, and he's, we set him this target and he hasn't quite achieved it, but he's working hard compared to a player who, if they're not achieving any of these targets or even working towards them, um, you know, there's an issue there. Um, the other good thing when it comes to targets is obviously from their point of view, from the, the motivational uh, point of view, you know, if they've got targets that, you know, reach that or have that um, determination theory, then, you know, they'll be buying into it because it should have some kind of autonomy to it. Um, it should be related to them. And obviously it should be, you know, close enough for them to get it. It's no point, you know, I can't put them a target of scoring a thousand goals in a season because ultimately they're never going to reach that. So it needs to be achievable for them. Um, which is one of the reasons why I've, I've brought up the smart target thing. Cause I think the smart targets are good. I think they get thrown around a lot. Oh, we, we, we're using smart targets. But I don't think um, it can apply as much um, to subjective targets. So, you know, a lot of the time when I'm talking to players and we talk about smart target setting, um, players will go, yeah, I want to work on my left foot. And suddenly that, that doesn't tick any of the boxes on this. 
Now, the only one you might, you might get time based because you might go, right, we're going to sit it over the next six weeks, but it's hard to monitor. Um, whilst the objective targets of, right, we want you to uh, per 90 minutes across six games or across this block, we want you to uh, receive on your left foot and play forward, um, I don't know, 10 times uh, across that block or, block or maybe twice per game across that block. That's great. But again, does that then have the relevance of working on the left foot? Is it actually working on the left foot? Um, or are they just being restricted and forced to try and just take touches on the left foot for the sake of it? And you almost lose that decision-making element. So when you're setting these targets, you need to think about how you use objective and subjective targets. Um, and you need to understand that they can be good targets, but they might not stick to that smart target. Um, so something to think about. Same with varied development and strengths. Um, so obviously when, you, when you're using or setting these targets, are you working on things that they need to work on in terms of uh, you know, an area development or a weakness? Um, it's something they need to make it. And I think that's important. Sometimes it's easy to go, oh, he's bad at heading, so we need to work on his heading. And it's like, okay, but he's a winger. His strengths are beating players. What you know? Does he really need to work on heading? Is that a, a real issue, or is it something that he needs to have? So if he's a centre back and he can't head it, then that would be a concern. That would be us going right. Okay, so we, he's good at all these other things, but he will not play League Two football or League One football if he can't head the ball. So that's something he needs to have. Um, and then obviously with the um, you know, an area development might be something that is going to help his strength come out even more. So again, going back to a winger, um, to get him beating players and driving down the line, he might have to work on his first touch because he keeps taking his first touch, but he wants to go inside. And when he's taking that touch inside, he then can't drive in and use his strength. So you then, you're then adapting the, the target to help bring a strength out, um, which I will use. Um, and then obviously you've got the strengths based stuff, which is, you know, turning a strength into a super strength to make it even better than it was. Or again, I know I've put it in both something that's going to get their strength out even more. And then another consideration when setting targets is, are you comparing them against themselves? So is it me versus me? I need to achieve in this block. I want to achieve a certain amount of, of um, forward passes, or I want to work on, driving forward um, down the wing. I want to get 10 crosses in across this block. Or is it me versus another player in terms of, am I compared against someone else in my team? So we're going right as a leaderboard, who gets the most crosses between these wingers or as an academy? Um, or if you're playing at a level where there is the data for it, if you're playing in, in a, you know, where they are tracking the data in the Premier League, say, it might be comparisons against each other. So that's why I've thrown the, the World Cup um, XG ratings for um, the top nine players but again you've got to think about the relevance for that because you might say right okay we want to increase this a, a certain thing we want you getting more XG we want you getting more shots but then is that relevant for a winger or is that relevant for that centre mid Ben do you mind if yep. you stop there one second on yep. the on the me versus me or me ag versus another player uh, to compare the development. Now, uh, obviously, as an academy coach, you have uh, different resources that is going to make things a bit easier um, to have objective um, measures to help the player to develop. Now, uh, if we go to grassroots football, uh, and obviously some coaches don't have the equipment or the human resources around them to one, film matches and then analyze those matches to be more objective on this development. Uh, what strategies or what advice would you give them to try to help the players uh, or to try to help the coaches to develop the, the players with objectives targets so i mean you can still track things if you let's say let's say you've got no video camera you can't record games 
So you can still use data. You can still um, track things just with, again, notate, notational analysis and just using a pen and paper um, to track in things like, okay, final third entries. So have we got the amount of final third entries we're looking for? Have we, and that, I mean, that's team-based, uh, but you could do it for individuals. Obviously, resources-wise in terms of your energy and, and focus, it might be difficult because if you're taking a whole team by yourself, then you're not going to be able to just track, you know, little Jimmy's passes forward. However, and again, another way that I've done it in the, in the past, with, um, especially with the foundation phase at Shrewsbury, um, I've given them the whiteboard. I've, I've, I've given the, the subs, um, so that let's say there's two or three players there, and I've given them a whiteboard, and they've tracked um, things that we're looking for. So we might set a target for that next quarter, or that next 15, 20 minutes, and go, right, we want to try and get um, five final third entries or, or whatever we're working on that week. We want, if we're working on counterattacking, say, we want to see if we can get shots away in 10 seconds. And they can track that. Um, and it, or if it's defending that we might say, you know, we want to try and regain the ball back in 10 seconds. And they can track, again, the number of times we did it and the number of times we didn't. And then that's a great little tool, again, to then, um, at that next break in the game, you might not even deliver that. You might say, right, you guys who have been on the bench, you tell them what you think. So they can then say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we got three final third entries or three counterattacks, um, which, was, which was good. And then they can give that a little bit more. You might have to uh, probe it a little bit and say, like, right, okay, so why, were this, why did we get so many? Why were, were we good? Um, and then you've almost got that that peer learning point of view as well, as well as again, you know, it's very easy for players on the bench to just be sat there and or kicking a ball around. It's you know, it, it's another tool to then um, not only coach the individuals on the pitch, but the individuals off the pitch as well. Yeah. Oh, great, great. I think I just got talking about that as well. I mean. I think resources is always going to be, you know, if you're a Premier League club and your academy is a cat one, lots of money, then you can track anything. You can you can use uh, to the point of, and especially in the next couple of years, like you're seeing it at the Premier League and other levels at the minute. And, you know, you can use, start using tracking data and you can start using um, rather than just event data. But again, you know, there's always going to be ways around it. Um, and again, it, just because you've got that information doesn't mean that, you know, you should be using it. So I'm just going to give a, an example on here. Um, so I was lucky enough to be invited down to, to deliver a, a presentation and, and an individual session um, at Brentford um, back end of last season um, to, um, to the first team staff there. So I got assigned to, uh, to deliver to, to a player called Ali Coot. Um, so basically they gave me a few videos I watch those videos um, from an objective and subjective point of view. Um, and from that, I would set targets of what I was looking for. I'd, I'd evaluate those sessions and monitor his performance. I'd then deliver an individual session. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of use that as an example throughout this. Um, so just, just as a quick uh, breakdown of, of Ali um, and his strengths and area development. So again, he was, he was very good at beating players in the final, uh, you know, in and around final third, middle third, um, quite creative on the ball. Um, Decision-making questionable at times in the final third, which will, I'll come on to in areas of development. Um, movement in the final third, very sharp, creative in the final third. Um, good on, that, on a high press and good in collecting the second ball, like he had that bit of aggression about him. His areas of development were recovering. So once the ball had gone past him, or especially on a, on a, if he did play left wing, because he played left wing in, in centre attack and midfield, if the left back had driven past him and then they lost possession with him deeper than the left back, he wouldn't sprint back to hold that position. He'd often just sort of wander in and let the left back do all the work um, backwards. Um, open up on the left foot, which again, talking about um, areas which will help their strength come out. Um, that is one definitely. So I'll, I'll show you the footage in a second. Um, and then his, another area of development was movements to receive deep um, to be on the angle more. 
So I, I focused on one attacking and one defending target from a subjective point of view. Um, and the reason why I've tried to go attacking and defending is, is so you can start to do two things in the same session. So I'd, I'd like to have some kind of flow um, to the sessions I, do, I, I use. So if it's an individual session, it's not just, right, okay, he's done the attacking stuff, that's it, because that doesn't happen in a game. Often there is a transition to defend or a transition to attack. And the same with any small sided game. So if you've got these two targets, they can focus on It's like, right, okay, I'm in attacking mode right now. So I want to try and receive on the left foot to drive forward. Right, we've lost possession. Defending mode. I want to be getting back into position. And again, I've, I've sort of set that target, you know, within six seconds um, for the upcoming block. You can then use data targets on top of that. Now, this is where you've, you have got to be careful. Um, and I think sometimes in academy football, we can definitely be guilty of, it can just be targets, 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 targets. You know, they've got individual targets set by us. They've got individual targets. They've set them by themselves. They've got uh, data targets. They've got, um, you know, targets set in other age groups. They've got um, targets that change every six weeks. And suddenly you ask and, and set for every session even, and suddenly you ask them what their targets are and they, I've got a million things to work on. I don't know. Um, or sometimes they, you know, the coaches set them a target and it's something that they're just really not interested in doing. Um, so with this, with this data targets, I've put them on here. Um, and this is what I tracked his performances across in these games against. Now he might not need to know the level of detail on this. It might just be a quick breakdown of, right, we've set these targets. And again, this is where you might set it for the individual. So these might be set to, right, these are for you, Ali. From what we see you're good at and what we think you need to work on, these targets are for you. It could be for that position. So it's going, right, this is what we're expecting from a, from a centre attacking midfielder. It could be targets of, you know, for a whole team or a, a unit when attacking um, or defending. It could be against opposition teams. But again, you've got to then got to have, you know, the problem is you have got to have the data there to, to show that. Um, and obviously, you've got to think about the relevance of that because again, it's no, it's no point. You can't compare to, you know, let's go Peter Crouch and um, Harry Kane, different types of players. So you've got to think about, again, you might, they're the same position and they might be, um, you know, when you compare players against each other, they might come up in the same profile, but they're different, completely different types of players. So again, you have to be careful with, with what you set. The data targets might be something that is more for uh, the key stakeholders. So if you're an individual coach um, and you, you've got these data targets, you might be going to the, the people above you and saying, right, okay, in this block or in this season, this is what generally what we've been expected from him. He hasn't achieved it. So we really need to think about at the end of this season, whether we're going to offer them that, that next contract or not. Um, rather than going to him every week and going, right, you've got to hit this or you haven't done this. So it's important to, you know, to really weight up um, who the targets are for and, and the purpose of them and not to overload the player. So sort of coming on to that last point in terms of um, comparisons and benchmarking. Um, so I've thrown these in. So there's on the, on the left-hand side, you've got the EFL um, League 2 uh, expected goals and expected assists per 90. Um, so all the players in there, so obviously they're ultimately they're, they're compared against each other. So you can start to see who's, you know, scoring more goals, uh, more expected goals, who's getting more expected assists. Um, or on the right-hand side, you've got a direct comparison between two players. Now, obviously the problem is this requires a lot of minutes to be played. So this is season season's worth of data. Um, and ultimately, especially in a development environment, it is extremely tough to get, you know, other teams' data for start. Um, but even then, to you know, coming back to resources, it's hard to, you know, if you can film every game, great. But if you can't film every game, or if you don't have access to that camera, it's then even more difficult. Um, plus, then especially with for under 18s players, it's you know, you've got potential safeguarding issues if you are requesting footage or. You know, the footage isn't going to be there. So again, you've got to think about ways around this. So if it's an under 18s level, you've got to come up with solutions 
if it's above 18, so if it is, uh, if they are playing first team football, then you might have some of this data. Even then, it, you know, for especially for for this at Brentford um, with their B team, you might not have that data that you're looking for. So solutions, um, you compare them against each other, um, or sorry, against themselves um, and their target, which is what I do in this. Um, you compare them against other players in the team. Um, or you play uh, compare them against other um, players in the club or in the academy, and that could be, you know, players that have made it. So if there's a player who's progressed into the first team and really kicked on, you might go right. What were his stats? What was he doing when he was at under 16s or under 18s? And that might be a target that you you build towards. Again, the problem is you've got to think about what type of player he was in the profile, um, or you might have targets set across the academy. This is generally what we're looking for first team. Um, so again, you've got you've got to think about creative ways around um, these problems. So I've I've had to do three of um, three of these, um, but I focused on the the Rangers game. So they played uh, Brentford B played uh, Rangers, um, and again I, I watched the footage from Ali. So in this game, I've tried to give uh, or, or pull out subjective points or performance um, video-based points in terms of um, attacking and defending um, as well as you know areas that were, were good his strengths as well as area development so I talked about his movement in, in you know movements inside were very good especially when he was playing as a left winger um, and an area development is receiving on the left foot so again one of his targets for this block and this is one of the reasons why he's got this target um, and then as you can see in the middle from the radar chart um, you know, we're looking at attacking to um, total attacking actions, and we've we've selected shots on target, uh, successful dribbles, successful passes. So, again, when we're coming to what you know, we set the, or I would set those in terms of what the club wanted or what I wanted from that player. So these are value, you know, these have got to be valued um, assets because you can track everything you want. I could, or you could track all the passes, you could track, you know, all this data but it's then what you do with that data, how you use that data. So as a club, we've, you know, we might value the successful passes, the successful dribbles, the shots on target as a centre attacking midfielder. That's what we're looking for. We want him to be progressive. We want him to get it forward on the pitch. Um, so that's why we'd, we'd especially pull out those points. The total attacking actions is um, all the attacking actions he's had together and the attacking contribution um, I'll come on to in, in a couple of minutes. Same thing, but from a defending point of view. Um, so again, other targets that we might be looking for from that attacking uh, centre attacking midfielder. Um, I know he played left wing in this game, but again, th this is where you might it might change depending on position as well. Um, so again, just a, a quick, you know, his recovery runs need to be quicker, but he's really good on the high press, especially for the second ball. Um, and again, th these two slides here might be things that you you might just print out and give to him. I definitely use video as well. And I've got a video coming up next. I've tried to limit the video in this as well, because I know sometimes it can be a little bit laggy. Um, but yeah, so this is, you know, you might use it this way. Um, it might be something that you use for, for key stakeholders. It might be something you just have as, as a report. Um, and if you have these reports built up over a season, you should be able to see, again, especially towards their targets, they should be progressing beyond them. So just to give an example, and I hope this comes through clearly. So this is talking about him receiving on his left foot. So he's got the ball now. So as you can see, rather than driving forward on the left, he cuts back on the outside of his right. Um, same for this one. He's about to see the ball now. Rather than open up on the left and being able to slide through, he wants to cut back on his right. Dropping deep this time. Rather than open up on the left foot, ends up going back on the right. In here, again, now this is the one I, I've used. Um, and I might just stop it there very quickly. Missed it. So this is the one I, I've used for the, the session. I'll come on to this in a bit. So rather than open up on the left and him having, um, can you see my mouse on there? Yes. Yeah. 
So rather than open on his left and take an advantage of the overload here, so either playing the ball wide into here, finding the, the ball through, or even at the very, you know, the very worst, opening up and play, playing that pass, or maybe finding the switch um, to the left back, he kills all those options by taking it on his right foot. And in the end, he goes on his right foot, tries to turn again, and then ends up running to a player. So rather than having a, you know, a pretty good opportunity, especially as the ball's coming from here, to play that pass or play that pass, he ends up cutting again to the same point he would have received on his left foot. But now this overload has been lost. All right, fine. There's still the player here, but he can't play it now anyway because there's so much pressure on him. So this player's screening these passes here. This player's putting pressure. He can't open up and play these passes because, again, these players are back in. And again, this is something that will get his strength out, even if he just to take a left, uh, left foot touch and drive on it. Same here, rather than open up on the left. Twice in a row. Wants to go on the right and go inside. And in this one, rather than taking a big touch on his left foot and being able to drive, wants to take it on the outside of his right, which is a hard touch, and ends up just sort of going into the player. So, and again, you'd use that video um, to break it down with the player, whether it's across a block, whether it's in the week. Um, and you might even draw that out of them by saying, can you, you know, against your targets, can you watch the footage and can you come back to me and think about how you got on against these targets? Um, so going back to the data in terms of, um, so we obviously we've got 100% being the target. And again, it is, it's very easy. You could easily... Um, when comparing against other players, you might have, right, okay, well, this player is getting, um, I don't know, 100 passes, say, and you've got 80. Now, the good thing with using targets like this is it's always going to be a clear 100% across the board of this is the target you're aiming for. So you can track that development. And also you can track it um, or you know, see the, pro the, the role they played in certain games. So the Rangers game, for example, um, you can see that his defending actions and contribution, I'll come on to contribution in a second, um, very high. But his attacking actions and contribution was quite low against his targets. Now, in that game, fair enough, you could say, you know what, it's against Rangers. They probably had to do a little bit more defending than attacking. Um, so yeah, his defending was good, but we, you know, we didn't get as much opportunity to attack anyway. So again, another consideration you have to have when, when doing this. However, you might say in that game, though, like you saw, he could have had a higher contribution if he had taken on his left foot and played that ball through. Um, the Malmo game, he came on later, later in the game anyway. So these, again, if it's, if it's not 90 minutes and um, you almost have to, uh, he came on for about 33 minutes. So you have to times it up to get 90. Um, which can create problems, but it's probably the best way to, to monitor it against um, other 90-minute games. So it didn't have much of an impact in terms of his performance. And then the Harrow game, he was, you know, had a really strong impact. So again, all, all his targets were, were beaten. Um, and the reason why I've selected actions and contributions, so again, it probably links back to um, what you value. So for this player, for Ali, you know, you you already got his attacking actions, which are things that you value anyway. But obviously, a pass, a sideways pass, is not the same as a as a forward pass. A sideways pass in the defensive third is not the same as a cutback or a sideways pass inside the in the box. So the attacking contribution is a is it takes the same numbers as the attacking actions, but it it has a bias towards certain things. If I want, if we want Ali to be doing lots of more work in the final third, we can then use a multiplier so we can go, right, so um, if he takes a, if he plays a forward pass um, in the middle third, that can be worth, you know, so one pass, it can be worth two. If it's a forward pass in the final third, it might be worth three. If it's a forward pass from the middle third to final third, that might be worth four. So you can then start to, uh, bias and start to um, use a multiplier to 
to show the contribution that you want. So, for example, in the, and again, in the Rangers game, you know, his actions are up there. Um, all right, still off the target. But his actual contribution, what we're looking for, still wasn't what we were expecting. We wanted to start trying to get forward more. And that's where you could argue that if he had taken that left foot touch and found that pass through, and let's say you got an assist out of that, and your you assist um, or a key pass, so a key pass being where someone gets a shot from the pass that you've just played, that might be worth 10 times because, again, he's done, he's done a good job. That, that pass is worth more than a pass in your own box. So that might have then bumped his contribution up higher. Again, that's per, per individual, per, um, per what you want out of it. So again, to, to show the averages for the block in terms of all those areas. So this is where you can break it down to attacking and defending in terms of, um, you know, attacking wise, you know, played a number of successful passes, not quite beat that target. Shots on target about there. Again, this is one of his strengths, dribbling. So it's good that it's staying above target. Um, and it shows that he's continuing to, to work on um, that dribbling. However, co attacking contribution wasn't what we wanted. So again, he was beating players, but was he finding that, you know, that final pass? Was his decision-making in the final third what we were looking for? Um, and then with defending, you know what? He's, about on, he's on, on target or above target for everything. Now, with all, again, with all data, you have to be careful of what it says. So especially with the successful target uh, tackles, um, and especially with defending data, you've got to be careful at times because ultimately a tackle, um, yes, all right, he's won the ball. And yes, it's higher, much higher than the, um, the target we set for him. But that could have been because of poor positioning or it could be um, from certain games where we've had to do lots of defending. So again, you, you know, you have to take that in consideration. But in this block as particular, we'd be going, you know what? His attacking is an area we need to think about the, the decision making in the final third and the actions in the final third, where he's going to get most of the, that attacking contribution and attacking points uh, needs to be higher. So off the back of this, then went into an individual session. Um, so I delivered that presentation and delivered a few other things. We went out to the pitch and I worked with, with Ali. Uh, for about 20 minutes. Um, so I took the context, like, a, you know, when I screenshot it, uh, uh, stopped it a second ago, took the context of re him receiving that, that pass across his body. So that picture right there, I took, um, I just realized the arrows haven't gone down, but don't worry about that. Um, took that and created the same picture um, on the training pitch. So as a coach, I stood here, uh, Four to five footballs. Um, he had three mannequins here. So he'd work off this mannequin so it, it, physically as well. Um, and obviously this is what you've got to think about is um, what day this is done on. If it's a day after a game, then you're not going to make it that intense. Um, so I, I did ask that question. So I tried to make it quite physically demanding as it was sort of um, midweek. Um, so he had to work off the mannequin and it had to open up on his left. Um, so we could play the switch, so it could be a big open body to find the ball into the first, uh, that goal. It could be just opening up to play that, or it could be cutting back to then play that. And then the final one um, was a touch to drive forward. So you've got different types of left-footed touches in there. You've got the one to open up and switch. You've got the one to, to play forward. You've got the one to cut back and play forward, and you've got the one to drive. So that's what we I, I did. I, we used um, four or five passes. Recoveries each time. So after he's played that pass, back to the mannequin, touch the mannequin, go. So again, you've got that physical element as well as, you know, one of his secondary objectives was that sort of recovering. Um, so after we, we've lost the ball, so can he get back? So again, it's just getting him switched on to right. I've played the action, bang. Um, in the breaks. So once we played those five passes, because it's quite intense, um, we'd collect the footballs. And again, it's not just an opportunity to go, right, get the footballs in quickly. It's an opportunity to go and talk and to have informal conversations around what he's doing. So 
as we went and walked the footballs, I started asking. And again, because I hadn't met the player before, I tried to build up a little bit of a relationship straight away. Um, asking him his thoughts on his games. And I said, like, you know, I've seen these games. Um, unfortunately, I did get to show him the footage and show him this beforehand, which would be something I'd probably do because it just paints the picture even better. Um, but I had a chat with him and sort of said, what was his target? What did he think? Um, and he was very much, you know, one of his targets he'd been set and was trying to work on was decision-making in the final third, which kind of linked into um, taking the touches on his left foot. Because again, if he takes the touch on his left foot, he'd then able to play these passes. His decision-making um, would be better or give him better opportunities. Um, so it was good to have a conversation as we're going through. And then I talked about the different touches and the different passes. Um, and then also, as we're talking, we did a few rounds of this. Um, and again, I could, I could sort of ask, you know, how, how he was feeling with the session, what his thoughts, uh, thoughts were about um, the left foot. Um, I, I changed the session a little bit. So I adapted it off the back of his feedback. So he was saying a lot more about, you know, he was saying about the decision making. So I said, right, okay. Rather than me just feeding the ball in from, from this side, I moved closer. So I moved to the mannequin. So I started firing the ball in again for his left foot. But off the back of the pass, I would either engage with him straight from the mannequin, so in a straight line, or I'd engage by curving my run. So off the back of my movement, he had a decision to make on top of that. So if I played it here and sprinted it in there, he would try to open up. So he'd play that pass or that pass. If I curve the run, he would try to cut back and play that pass or he would open up and play the switch. And then again, like we tried to finish. I, I, in the end, I did it with two shots um, just outside the box because, again, in an area that sort of links into what he does. Um, and again, like it might be like one of the ones we talked about was the disguised left foot touch. So he's got the drive forward. He's got the cut back. So we said about like if I'm engaging from a, from a certain angle, Rather than him, he might look like he's going to open up that way. So I might even make my run even more that way to then cut back, to then go forward, to then drive or play that pass. So we worked for about 20 minutes, blocks of about a minute at a time, but it was intensity was there. And again, that's what I wanted. I want the intensity. I want it to be um, like he's in a game um, and then use the minute maybe to collect the footballs in um, as an opportunity to rest as well as an opportunity to, to have those informal conversations. Um, after that, that individual session, I then went inside and answered a, a number of questions and, and spoke to the first team staff. Um, this is the next two slides are sort of talking about what it would, that kind of work would look like within a position specific session or a, a team based session. Um, so the individual in a specific, uh, position specific session. Um, so you say you've got your centre mids here. And again, I've, I've done quite a few of these sessions with, with um, different positions. Um, I try to make it um, so it flows. So again, I, I don't want it to be, it breaks down all the time. So this session, for example, 3v2, um, the two uh, blues, they need to stop the reds breaking out um, down the mannequin side the mannequins uh, the four mannequins the bat line um, that's an offside line what the reds need to do is find a through pass and then a one touch finish so into the into the corners of the goal if you've got a goalkeeper great if you haven't got a goalkeeper use mini goals in the corners use um, mannequins in the corners use poles in the corners um, so again in this session your session might be focused on the midfield three working as a unit on the rotation and finding through passes. But for um, Ali here, the number eight, he's still getting to use, just from my position, I can still punch the ball into him on his left foot. He still gets to practice that, open up on his left foot to then find the switch, find the through ball, or depending on where the 10 is, maybe cut back to find the ball through or um, open up on the left and play that next pass or drive on it, depending if he, if he's deeper. So again, you can still get that individual in that session in a, in a position specific session. And then on the teams, on the team level, 
uh, if you've got a team session, and again, uh, this could be a little bit more difficult because ultimately it's going to be set by who's taking the session. So if you, if you take the session, then great, because you can structure it however you want. Um, so take this session, for example. Um, it's almost like a little game. One goalkeeper for the red team, uh, five outfield players, back line and a centre defensive mid. Um, for the blue team, two wingers, striker, three midfielders. So what you can have in this is, and again, look at the, the coach position and my position within this. So it's just a normal game. The only uh, other thing is the, the dotted line. Um, you can say only the blues can go into, um, or the blues can go into, um, the reds can't unless the ball is played in there or they take their first touch there. Something along the lines of that. Um, so within this session, you can still work on Ali with his left foot. So it might come naturally as part of the session anyway, because it's all based within the final third of the pitch. Um, or this is where, as a coach, you can use it as an opportunity to either go use your restarts. So if the ball goes out of play, rather than just going right, just kicking it on anywhere or just playing from goal kicks or whatever, you might have it as a restart of firing it, the ball into Ali. So suddenly the ball's always going from the right-hand side to his left foot, and then he has to make the decision. And again, it's live in a game. As I fire that ball in, is he going to open up? Is he going to play through? Is he going to play back in this way? Is he going to cut back and find that through ball? Is he going to take a touch forward? So again, you still get to work on Ali um, within, a, within a team session. And again, I've done restarts. Um, so restarts in a session is, is a, you know, can be used so well, whether it's for developing set pieces. Because again, often in a session, how many times do you see coaches will just feed the ball in rather than going, you know what, let's have throw-ins. Because we never, you know, we'll go to a game, go, oh, we're terrible at throw-ins. But then do we ever work on it within the sessions? Does it ever come up in the sessions? Or do we want it to make it, you know, we want to make it all look pretty and, and flow nicely rather than going, right, no, we're keeping this same ball. We're only using one ball today and we're taking throw-ins. So suddenly you've got that element. Um, or, and again, I've done it with, a, you know, in a team session that I wasn't taking, um, you know, one of the other coaches was taking it and I did a second ball. So every time that ball went dead, I'd play the second ball in. So the second ball was, I would stand on the far end of the pitch. There was a player who needed to work on, a centre-back that needed to work on heading. And every time the ball went dead, the second ball would be from me. So bang, fired in, in the air. He had then had an opportunity as an individual to work on his head in within that team session. Um, and then I've just tried to give a couple of examples of you might have multiple uh, individuals within that session that you're trying to set targets for. So, for example, you've got Ali. Great, he's in there. But you might have a, a lad called Joe who needs to work on his switch and play. So you might pull him on the back end of the practice so that he's under less pressure. You might have, then have a lad called Tom who needs to work on crossing him in particular cutbacks. So again, you might say, right, I want you to hold out there. And I want to see if you can either take your first touch forward and get your second touch inside, breaking the dotted line, or can you take your first touch to break the dotted line in here? So again, you, you've got individual targets within that session. Now, it might not be that you're, you get full control of that session. So it might be you just set tasks within the session. So you've got the session structure that defines this and gets them to work on this. It might be the session task that get, get, gets this. And I've just tried to give three very quick examples of, of session tasks. So using restrict, relate, reward. So you might have Ali and you say, right, you can only use your left foot on your first touch. So he's restricted. If he, if he takes on his right foot, free kick. So he's restricted. It takes a decision-making element away, but it forces him to use it. It puts him in an uncomfortable area, which means he has to do it. And then after a few games or a few, few blocks or whatever, you might then take that away and change it. So he then has that decision-making element. You've got, uh, say, Joe. You might relate to him just saying, right, try to switch in two touches. So there's no consequence or reward or anything. It's just, can you try and switch in two touches? And that's when you can have conversations um, at any point and say, like, you know, what do you think? Oh, I've generally taken three or four touches. So, right, okay, so how can we get it down to two? Okay, I can step off a little bit to give me some more space. I can open up a little bit more. Um, I, can, I can start scanning more to see what's, what's there. Um, and then using Tom's as well as a reward. So you might have um, for the left winger, right, 
counts as two goals if the team scores from a cutback. Now, that might be just for the individual. You might tell everyone that because now all of a sudden those players will try and find Tom even more, which sort of relates to Ali and Joe anyway because Joe wants to switch and especially if the second ball is coming from the coach, Joe wants to switch. Ali wants to take on his left foot and sometimes that might be the switch into Tom. And if Tom can get that touch on the inside and cut back and we finish, you get two goals so it, or three goals or whatever. So the task as well will have a big impact. And then obviously you've got the session outcome of, of coaching those players. So how you deliver that. So using drive-bys within the session, using in the breaks, using it pre and, and post-session. Um, and that, that, all this will play a big part um, in terms of who's taking the session. So if this isn't my session, if this is your session, then I might not get a say on the structure. I might not get a say on the task. I might be able to say, you know, walk in and go, right, you know, Ali, I want you to try and use your left foot. On the next five, Ali, can you just, just use your left foot? So you can still use those tasks, even if it's not your session. Um, and then the same with the coaching, because, you, you know, if it's your session, you can go, right, stop, stand still, and you make your points. But especially when working individuals, if you're stopping it, you're going to be stopping it every five seconds, and you're going to have a lot of people stood around whilst working with one individual. So using drive-by. So as the session's going on, stepping in, going, right, think about this. And again, you've got to be really effective with your communication to make sure it is a quick stop um, for that player. It could be in the breaks. And again, this is, this is quite effective in terms of, especially informal conversations. If the coach is calling everyone in, you have 10 to 15 seconds, especially if it's on a bigger pitch, for that player to get from point A to where the coach is. So go across that player. And as you're walking in to, you know, what did you think? Oh yeah, I did take a lot more touch on my left foot. That's good. So I want to see more of that. And then he goes in with the coach. Or opposite, once the coach has finished talking and they're setting up, you might have a chat or in the water break or whatever. And then obviously you have pre and post session. Um, and I'm just throwing this up at the end um, just to sort of go back to the point. So I've tried to, again, with all of this, I know it's a, a, a lot of detail um, and a lot of content and I've tried to restrict it as much as possible um, to try and, keep it as simple as possible whilst getting as much, as much detail as possible. Um, but yeah, I've tried to focus around again, these points um, and focus on the individual. So got any questions? No, oh, that, that was great. Uh, thank you, Ben. Great presentation. Uh, just uh, a quick one on, yep. on the data target. Uh, yep. At what uh, age would you start applying these data targets, uh, especially if you're going to share this with the player? Um, again, you, you've got to be careful of um, overloading any player of any age um, with too much information. And again, with, with data, um, a lot, you know, some of it will be based around resources. And again, it's, it's the point of what you're, you're trying to get across. If you've got a, an under nine, then using data is probably not going to be the best way to get across what you want because they probably won't understand or take the data on board. They won't see the importance of it. They're just playing the game. And again, you don't want to take that element away of and take the fun out of the game. Um, however, again, there's, there's ways you can do that. So with the restrict relate reward, if you're playing games, um, you can have it so that, right, okay, um, Jimmy, who's up front, um, if he scores, he gets three goals. Or, you know what, in this next game, um, if you score with your left foot, it counts as, as two. You still, from a, from a training point of view, you can still be technically working on things and, and almost collecting data in terms of them getting touches in the final third on their left foot and things like that. But you, you're setting it in a game environment or setting it as a, a competition element a reward element to it. Um, if it's in a game, again, like I said, with the, with the foundation phase players, you might go, right, okay, we want to, yeah, in the, in the final third, or pick a player, because um, we've been working on this recently, count the number of times that they, I, I'm just going to keep using the left foot as, a, as an example, but take the, count the number of times they get a touch on their left foot compared to their right foot. So you, it's, it's how you use that, that data. And again, from that data, I probably wouldn't be using that to, um, to track the players 
obviously as they start to go youth development phase and you know 16s 18s that's when that data might become more important because you can start to break down a little bit more detail in terms of what you're looking for from from players um, and they can take that on board so as a striker you might be saying look we want you to get more final third entries we want you to receive the ball more inside the penalty area we want to see more shots in the penalty area compared to 10 yards outside the penalty area so you can then start to use their touches and that type of data and there's a good chance as well you'll have more footage from that time as well um, and then obviously beyond that then you can start comparing data and obviously the, the other thing is the is the key stakeholders because if you go into a meeting um with first team staff with first team players then especially if, if from a recruitment point of view you'd probably have to go in and or i'd like to think that you know a number of clubs will go in and go right let's look at the data for this player um is he going to be better than or on comparison to some of our players or is he is he not as, as strong if that's the case, then we won't sign them. So I, th I think, again, data can be used from any age. It's, it's understanding why you're using it. It's got to have a reason for using it. You can't just – we can track everything, but is there any point to tracking – you know, we can count the amount of steps they take, but is there any point to tracking the amount of steps that an under nine takes? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that, that, make, that makes sense completely. Good. Yeah, well, that, that's really my, my last question. And well, for, for the people watching this webinar, uh, obviously it's not live. So if, if you want to leave any questions, just leave it in the comment area and I'll pass these questions to Ben. So we'll answer those questions if you have any after watching this video. Uh, well, Ben, uh, really appreciate your, your time with us today. Uh, I think it's a fantastic insight on how to, to develop and use the analysis to help individuals to, to improve during the, the academy environment. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. And again, it's, it's been nice to, to show some of this, this work. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's the, uh, you know, it's definitely my, my way of doing it and my way of thinking. Um, so, you know, we're all developing, we're all learning. So, you know, there's, there's going to be ways, better ways to do things and, that's the point of why we do this. So, no, but no, thanks for the opportunity. No, thank you so much, Ben. See you soon. So, thanks. See you later. Bye bye.